Gabrielle is a doctoral candidate right now at Ben Gurion University. And she hold, already holds a BA in cultural studies, a BA in social work, and her MA in Jewish studies. She's a very busy student. She's already for over 10 years been a researcher and lecturer about the various sectors and subdivisions of Israeli Orthodox Jewish society and the history of Orthodox Jewish life with an emphasis on the history and legacy of Polish Hasidic court. She's the co-founder co of the Polish Tisch, a unique international project exploring the history, teachings, and the religious and intellectual legacy, legacy of Polish Hasidic communities through bi-weekly 90-minute interactive lectures in English via Zoom. Thank you so much for being here today, Gabriela. Thank you so, so much for you also for joining. And uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy the class. Uh, thank you so much also for uh, Professor Seidman and uh, Dr. Ilan Fuchs for their amazing uh, classes before me. And also Professor Seidman uh, is one of the probably the top scholar about the Beis Yaakov movement in the world today and uh, her mother uh, is almost 100 years old and she is, I think, that the oldest living Beis Yaakov teacher. So, uh, and uh, the place where she studied to be a teacher, we will actually discuss today in uh, our program because uh, today's program is about Jewish geography, but it's not a simple Jewish geography. It's Orthodox Jewish geography and the Jewish geography of the Beis Yaakov schools uh, in Eastern Europe uh, between uh, uh, the two world wars. And uh, we could see very, very interesting phenomena about these schools. We could see that there are certain areas that uh, almost in every small town, there is a Beis Yaakov and in other regions, which have a very, very significant Jewish population, even Orthodox Jewish population, the Beis Yaakov schools are almost non-existent or even non-existent. So what is the reason for that? What do you think? So for that, to answer to this question, we need to map out these particular Orthodox Jewish communities in Eastern Europe. I'm talking about Poland, Lithuania, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, and so on and so forth. And uh, we need to see uh, what type of Orthodox streams are the most prevalent in these areas, who are the leaders of these communities, how they are connecting to Orthodox organizations, for example, to the Aguda Stroal, and uh, how, much, uh, how much are they flexible to modernity, uh, women's Torah study, uh, and the like. So uh, uh, first, uh, when we are opening up these maps where these Beis Yaakov uh, schools are listed, and uh, they are listed from 1931. So actually, when the, wor the, when the World War broke out, in 1939, uh, there were much more schools than they are listed in the map, the two maps, which I will show you. Uh, these two maps actually coming from the central office of the Beis Yaakov schools and uh, 1931, I mentioned they are handwritten and we also need to take it into consideration that they are listing the towns or cities where the schools are located in the local name. So the Romanian, uh, certain Romanian schools will be listed with the Romanian name, not with the Yiddish name or the Jewish name. So, so when we see a place named Cernauti, Cernauti is the Romanian name, but in Jewish, uh, Jewish consciousness, this is Chernovitz. So uh, it could be certain, uh, uh, certain differences. Also many Lithuanian towns we will uh, see listed with their Lithuanian name that probably we never heard about them 
I'm absolutely sure that everybody here heard about uh, uh, Kovno, but I'm not sure that, uh, that everybody could say that this is the city which is called Konas in Lithuania. So, uh, so I will also translate for you to the regular Jewish names. And, uh, and it's very important, very important to take into consideration the border changes, especially the border changes after the First World War, which totally messed up the maps and uh, many times even the identity of Eastern European Jewry. Uh, so if we can see the first map, I would be very, very happy and very thankful to Shira. Thank you so, so much for showing us the map. Uh, so what we can see, we could see very, very small Lithuania and we could see a relatively huge Poland. So uh, we also need to talk about it that after uh, the First World War, uh, certain parts of Lithuania became part of Poland. For example, Vilna, the legendary town of Litvish Jewry uh, in the name Vilnius became a Polish town. Today, again, we have independent Lithuania as they had between the two world wars and the capital city is Vilnius. But it was not like this after the First World War. The capital city was Konas and uh, Vilnius uh, became a Polish town, a North Polish town. Uh, also Poland got uh, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the past, uh, this huge area which is called Galicia. And Galicia is very much part of Jewish consciousness and Jewish history, but uh, it ceased to exist as an independent entity for a long time. And, uh, uh, but in our Jewish uh, history classes is very, very important. And if I tell you place names like, like Lijans, like Jikov, like Ropshitz, uh, Sans and Bobov, even Husiatin, uh, Kopishnitz, or, uh, or for example, Chortko, these are all Galician cities one of them in the west, one of them on the east. In those times, it was part of Poland and the Beis Yaakov schools were also spreading out in Galicia. Uh, the first Beis Yaakov school founded by Sara Schneider in 1917 in Krakow. And it became a tremendous success after a very, very short while. And uh, the Agudas Israel movement, uh, the Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, umbrella organization, international organization, which founded in Katowice in 1912, uh, actually uh, seen the importance of Orthodox Jewish women's education and the Beis Yaakov schools and uh, the Beis Yaakov schools got under the umbrella of the Aguda. And of course, with the help of the Aguda, more and more and more and more schools could be founded. And also more and more schools get opened outside of the border of Poland. Since in the Aguda, there are activists from Germany, Kirchian Neo-Orthodox, Polish Hasidim, Lithuanian Talmidei Chachamim, so this is really an international organization, uh, even in the United States, uh, Aguda is very active, uh, but uh, the first place is Krakow. 
uh, after Krakow, uh, certain schools opening up uh, in the area. Uh, obviously, in the capital city of Warsaw, there are also based Yakov schools. Uh, and also uh, in other big cities like Lublin or Lodz, for example. And we could see that in 31, you see these small, small, small points uh, in the map of Poland, and they are all uh, base Yakov uh, schools. Uh, most of them are like uh, after schools. The girls are going to regular schools since there is mandatory education in Poland. And after their, uh, after their uh, school day finish, they go into the base Yakov and studying in the Kodesh. Uh, but uh, there is a huge demand for the base Yaakov and this type of education. And there are also teacher seminaries opening up. One of them, Krakow. You could see the bigger points, Krakow in the south. Then you are going more up. This is Lodz. And uh, in the center of the Polish map is Warsaw. So what can we say? about uh, these big cities. Uh, I would like to uh, say something about Lodz. Lodz is, uh, is a very important industrial center. It's also called to be the Manchester of Poland. Why is called to be the Manchester of Poland? Uh, because industry, especially light industry and the textile, this is the major profile of the city. We could understand from that, that there are a lot of factories and also a certain type of Jewish working class gets developed in this place. There are Jewish industrialists, even Hasidic industrialists who are owning factories. Some of them are bigger ones, some of them are smaller ones, but there is like a Jewish upper middle class and even a Jewish bourgeoisie, and there are a lot of poor Jews. For example, in the district of Balut, they said that the district of Balut is like really the uh, uh, embodiment of poverty, and that's a Jewish neighborhood. So one of the goals of Sarah Shmira and the Beis Yaakov teachers also to get out the girls from these factories because if the girls do not have a higher education, they do not have a profession, where they will end up, they will end up in the factory, working three shifts, extremely, extremely hard life. And of course, if you have this extremely hard life in the factory, very, very, very high chance that the bundes or other socialist movements will get you because the circumstances are so hard. So for the women, it's even better not to get there. Uh, it's also hard for the men. They have the Poale Aguda Israel, uh, the workers' movement of the Aguda. But for the women, it's better not to. There is also an organization, school types, which is called Ochel Sara. Ochel Sara are vocational schools where girls can, uh, can learn bookkeeping, typing, sewing, so on and so forth. All of these useful professions. In the 1930s, there were already 30 Ohel Sara vocational schools. And since uh, when we see in the map of, uh, of uh, Poland, we could see that we have one, two, three, four, five, even six uh, Beis Yaakov schools in Lodz. So my question is, it's only a question because I don't know it for sure, that how many Ohel Sara schools we have uh, in this five. Probably we have to uh, one or two because uh, Lodz is such an industrial city and they definitely need this type of school there. Uh, there is also a phenomena that uh, Beis Yaakov girls who, uh, who finish the seminary and they are very, very enthusiastic, 
Many times they are traveling in Poland, traveling back to their own small town, and they uh, start to speak uh, uh, for the women's groups, the ladies' groups, and they uh, really enthusiastic to set up a base Yaakov also in this place. And many times this is uh, how it uh, end up. And in Poland in 1937, two years before the Holocaust started, there were 250 base Yaakov schools uh, in Poland with 38,000 students. This is enormous. This is enormous. If we are comparing it with Lithuania, Lithuania, which is also very much a center of Torah, in 1935, there were 16 base Yaakov schools only and 2,000 students. Uh, so the most uh, populous place uh, among base Yaakov students is definitely Poland. If we see uh, other vicinity, for example, Warsaw, Warsaw, after the First World War, became a Polish Hasidic capital. Many of the rabbis who, before uh, uh, this uh, great war, they lived in small towns intentionally. Uh, actually, the front destroying their court, destroying their life. So they feel safer in the big city. They move into Warsaw, they opening up their courts in Warsaw. For example, the Novominsky Rebbe, also the Piaszczesna Rebbe moves to Warsaw. Uh, but there are also others who are uh, staying in their smaller places. But Warsaw is definitely a great Orthodox Jewish and Hasidic hub. And uh, for sure, the Beit Yaakov schools uh, are also flourishing here. Who are the biggest supporters in Poland of the Beis Yaakov movement? Uh, we could say, of course, from the Hasidic side, we have the Imre Emet of Gore, uh, who from the beginning was a great supporter of the movement. And also the Hafez Chaim, who ends up uh, in Poland and uh, part of the Lithuanian Talmidei Chacham. Uh, there are other courts who are very supportive. And there are others who are more reluctant in the beginning. I heard it from descendants of Alexander Hasidim that in the beginning, uh, the uh, Alexander uh, Rebbe, the Tiferet Shmuel, uh, who was the third Alexander uh, Rebbe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so he, was kind of reluctant about the Beis Yaakov schools because Alexander was quite of an anti-modern community, but in the, in the other hand, very accepting for all different types of Jews. But since women education, Jewish women education for them was like a sign of modernity, in the beginning, they were less supportive. This is what I heard. I never seen it written. But afterwards, they seen that it's really strengthening Orthodox Judaism. They did support the movement. And we could even see that there is a Beis Yaakov school in Alexandrov, which is the Polish name of Alexander. Uh, afterwards, uh, we could see names here in the map that uh, are actually names of various Hasidic courts. For example, Henshin, uh, Gora Kalvarya, the famous Gur. Uh, we also see here uh, Mogle Inica, Otvo. Gabriela? Gabriela? Yes. Hi, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to give you about a five minute warning that you want to switch um, to the other map. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, so much. Skierniavit, Sokachev, Sokolov. Uh, these are all places that they have their own Hasidic court and their own Hasidic Rebbe. And they also have their own base Yaakov. Uh, there are also places uh, which a very, very enormous Orthodox Jewish presence 
For example, Pabian, it's uh, uh, close to Lodz. Uh, we, could, uh, we could talk about uh, Sokachev, uh, Sosnovitz, the industrial city of Sosnovitz. Absolutely, they have uh, based Yakov schools. Uh, although if we are going to Galicia, which is a different setup uh, like central Poland, uh, we also see names uh, like Gorlice, Lansut, Zeshov, which is the famous Raisha, Przemysh, which is uh, Premishlan, Shevors. Uh, uh, also, uh, also Lijans, Buchach, uh, very, very uh, much like uh, famous Jewish names uh, uh, in Orthodox uh, Judaism, and uh, and also from this map we could we could see basically what the Jewish world lost and what type of renewal and what type of Renaissance started uh, in the end of the 1910s after, uh, after the First World War, during the time of the First World War. And it just had a very, very drastic, tragic, and brutal end. Uh, if we are talking about Lithuania here, uh, we also need to uh, see that in that map, we don't see, not in the list, and not in the smaller map, the city Vilnius. Okay, we could say that we don't see in the smaller map because Vilnius is not part of independent Lithuania. It's where, where are the Basiakov schools in Vilna? This is also a question for me. I need to double check that there, there were no Basiakov schools in Vilna. This is what I actually found in certain uh, sources. But what I can say for sure that in 1931, there were no base Yakov schools in Vienna. It could be that in the next eight years, they opened up something, but it was a competitor actually in Vienna, which was called the Yovne, uh, the Yovne uh, school system for girls. It was also very scholarly, very Torah based, but they were even more including secular subjects than the base Yakov. Uh, so we can see three uh, circled red points. And uh, one of them in this triangle uh, in the north is Tels. Lithuania named Telsha. Uh, afterwards, in the other side, we see Ponovich. Uh, also with the Lithuanian name that I could not pronounce. I'm very, very sorry. And uh, in the bottom of this triangle of the, of the three uh, reddish uh, circles, this is Kaunas or Kaunas, uh, which is, I think, that the oldest city of Lithuania, also a major Jewish center with the Yiddish name Kovno, uh, probably known by almost everyone. And very interesting, all of these places have very famous yeshiva. The Tels yeshiva, the Ponovich yeshiva, the Tels yeshiva actually transferred to the United States, to Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, the Ponovich yeshiva with Rav Kahneman transferred to Bnei Brak, to Israel. And uh, the Slobodka uh, yeshiva is a little bit less prevalent so, uh, today. It still exists in Israel, but uh, it doesn't have uh, so much of a, a very uh, high and, uh, and uh, large student base as they had in the 1920s, 1930s, even before. So why I talk about Slobodka? I have to talk about Slobodka because Slobodka is actually an outskirt of Kovno, an outskirt of Konas. And uh, it's a very, very scholarly city. Uh, we could see uh, in smaller other cities that uh, we almost couldn't read the name. There are 
there is one uh, that it's called uh, Mariam Paul uh, in the south. There is one that is called Kaidan or Kaidani. Uh, uh, this is the place uh, where the wife of the Gra, the gown of Vilna, came from. And uh, also, uh, we could uh, we could uh, see here in in the very very uh, north, uh, in the very top, a place that again the Lithuanian name is Shu uh, uh, in in Jewish and Yiddish name is Shovel or Shovel. And uh, Shovel was a main commercial center, main Jewish center, and very, very, very famous people came from there. Uh, the most famous of them is the Eliashiv family. Also, Yosef Shalom Eliashiv, a uh, major decisor uh, of Halakha from Yerushalayim, uh, who needs to a couple of years ago, he was born in Shovel in that very place, and his grandfather, uh, Shlomo Eliashiv, or other name, the Leshem Shvobe Achlama, uh, was the famous Mekubal, the famous Kabbalist of Shavol, and uh, they also called him the prince of the uh, hidden part of, uh, of the Torah, and, uh, and he's one of, he was one of the Major, uh, major theoreticians of uh, uh, Lithuanian Kabbalah, the Lithuanian school of thought, uh, mystical school of thought. A very, very interesting personality. And two years before his death in 1920s, the whole family uh, actually uh, moved uh, to the mandate of Palestine and settled in Yerushalayim with the help of Rav Kook. Uh, who was the uh, student of the grandfather. So these were these communities that I wanted to introduce you in Poland and Lithuania, where the Beis Yaakov schools are very active. Uh, all of these places have a very, very strong Aguda presence. So basically not so much question about how Beis Yaakov would develop or not develop in Poland and Lithuania because most of the rabbis are very supportive uh, of this movement. But if we are moving to another map and to uh, other geographical locations, we could see that this is actually not all the time true. Gabriela, before I move to the second map, there's one question maybe um, you yes, can ask. Yes, absolutely. Um, someone asked, were there more women than men working in the factories, making the Beis Yaakov movement and the Aguda more fearful that the Jewish women would join the Bund and become irreligious than, than the men would? I don't think, I don't know actually the, the, the gender quantities here. Uh, probably more men were working in the factories. This is what I think. But uh, I think that the perception was like this, that for women, get into the hard life of the factories is more dangerous than for men. Also for the hardship, leaving the family, and also the, the various uh, agitators of the other movements, that, uh, that they were really fearful about. And uh, in those years, it was still an opportunity to, to uh, work as a seamstress privately or a hat maker, and they could make a decent living. But if they did not have these skills for these trades, it was impossible to go into this profession. So that's why I see also uh, a very, very uh, uh, big positive effect of this Ohel Sara schools because they actually catering for a real problem. Um, I'm not sure about the second part of the question. Um, 
I guess you answered it about joining another movement. Yeah. And then yeah, it was it was a constant fear. It was a constant fear. And actually, these movements were extremely appealing yeah. because the life of the working class and also the life of the poor society was so, so terrible that we cannot really imagine it. Like sometimes in one room, nine people were sleeping. And uh, many times, uh, 1920s, 1930s, you could read in the memories, either religious or secular, that uh, the kids uh, wore the clothes of each other, one after the other. Maybe it's not that tragic. But when they had one pair of shoes for five siblings, this is really, this is really bad. This is, <laughs> this is really problematic. And unfortunately, these type of things also happen. I don't say that in every family, but these type of things are happen. And of course, if we are living in this type of conditions, the, the Bund and the socialist movements and the communists are much more appealing. Shelly, does that answer your question? You're, you can unmute if you'd like to clarify. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. But th there's a parallel question. And the parallel question is, there were people, uh, there were Jewish families, especially in the cities, who had a little money and sent their daughters to the gymnasiums, and their daughters did not want to marry uh, from guys. And is that why um, the uh, Gouda backed um, uh the base Yaakov movement so that they could try to keep these girls from being influenced by the gymnasium? It's an excellent question. I really love this question. This, this is also uh, a major reason why the Aguda is backing the base Yaakov schools since there is a big disparity between the girls' education and the boys' education. Many times they're living in two separate worlds. The girls sometimes speaking high Polish, they're reading Mitzkiewicz, they, they can play Chopin on the piano, and these boys barely know how to speak the language of the country. They speak Yiddish and they studying Talmud. So these Orthodox families because, because how we will marry these boys up to these girls uh, many times these girls kind of running away to a more modern culture. And Sarah Schneider, who was an excellent sociologist in my eyes and sociographer, she even wrote in her diary that when the men are leaving and going to the Rebbe in Rosh Hashanah, we are alone. And they have basically fun and what we do have, we are going to the shul, there are the old ladies, and the old ladies have their old-fashioned practice-based Judaism, and the young generation of girls who are educated in the gymnasia, they are driven by their passions, they're interested in beauty, they're interested in art, they want to go to dance, they want to go to the theater, they want the joy. And they are kind of uh, moving away from orthodox practices because of that. So we need to educate these girls. And we need to give them intellectual content even to, to see that Judaism is, is versatile. It's a valuable. This is a type of life that's worth living, that there is beauty in it, there is intellectual inquiry in it. There is meaning in it. And uh, this, is, this is a huge problem. And the Besiakov schools are definitely uh, giving an answer to that. And, uh, and the Imre Emes of Gur, he was very, very respecting Sarah Schneer. And he said that uh, if not for her, to whom my Hasidim could marry? <laughs> so it's very interesting in, uh, in the interwar period, it was definitely a, a, a big deal and a big question. We have um, one more question. I don't know if it's yes. on the map. Um, and I'm not sure I can pronounce this city, but Siloai is getting close mm -hmm. to the Latvian border. 
And um, the question is, was there anything which is in Latvia today? Uh, I think that this city is still Mamesh, Lithuania. Uh, this is the city of Shovel in a Jewish name, what I was talking about. But I just check it right now. If you want, there is this place uh, right now situated. I'm absolutely sure that it's, uh, it's Lithuania still. Uh, okay, can I switch to the next map for when you're-, yes, when you're absolutely, absolutely, please. And uh, we will and get back to- Hadassah, Hadassah is confirming that you are right. It is in Lithuania. Okay. Yes, it's near the Latvian border. Uh, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, uh, you can go on. When we see the next map, the next map will be really, really, really eclectic because we are going from Vienna until Bukovina. Bukovina is again like this type of legendary Jewish territory that maybe we read about it in the novels, doesn't exist anymore, but it had a lot of, lot of base Yaakov schools. Uh, we could see in the map of Romania, uh, the area of Maromaros also had two base Yaakov schools, which was true uh, for uh, 1931. And uh, also the, uh, the more uh, 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 closer to Hungary, those parts that it's more closer to Hungary and called Partium also had one base Yaakov school in Oradja. Uh, what is very interesting for us that we see this uh, roundish uh, reddish circle in Vienna. Yes, in Vienna, there is, a, there is a higher school, a teacher training seminary. Uh, Vienna is very, very instrumental uh, in the history of Beis Yaakov because uh, Sarah Schmierer during the First World War spent considerable amount of time in Vienna. And this is the first time that she's encountering with something uh, that women uh, could uh, study uh, more Torah and Humash, and uh, it really resonates for, with her ideas and soul. And also this whole Hirschian movement, uh, Torah in Derech Eretz, and, uh, and is definitely uh, uh, getting uh, very inspiring for her. Uh, Vienna, uh, is a much, much more interesting city in terms of Orthodox Jewish communities. Already in the First World War and after the First World War than it was before, because, because it's getting a wide range of communities that they did not exist in Vienna before. Okay, who are moving to Vienna after the First World War? Heads up. Okay, so I tell, uh, many of the rabbinic figures and leaders of the golden dynasty of Ruzhin, uh, like communities like Sadigura, Chortkov, Kopishnitz, they are moving to Vienna. Why are these leaders moving to Vienna? Because their communities uh, and their cities or small towns, they got destroyed and they running away from the front. And many of them are even staying in Vienna. Uh, so Vienna, because of them, get a very high inflow of Galician Jews. And this is actually changing the map of uh, Orthodox Jewry a bit uh, in Vienna. We also see uh, next to Austria, a very interesting entity, which is called Czechoslovakia. It doesn't exist anymore because there is Czech Republic and Slovakia. After 1990, there were even changes in the middle, but I'm not going into that. 
uh, we could see that the base Yakov schools are especially existing in the Slovakian part and not in the Czech part. I don't see any base Yakov schools in Prague, not in Brno, uh, and not in other Czech cities. But in Slovakian cities, there are base Yakov schools. So what was Slovakia before the First World War? This part of Slovakia was part of Greater Hungary, as much as part of Romania was part of Greater Hungary. Hungary was the biggest, uh, we could see, victim or loser of the First World War because almost 70% of its territory went to neighboring countries because of the Trianon Peace Treaty. Uh, so many of the Jews of Slovakia are not speakers of the Slovak language, but they are speakers of the Hungarian language. And many times they are identifying either as Hungarian Yekes, there is a community like this in Presburg, which is called to be Bratislava, the city of the Hatam Soifer and his descendants, uh, or they identifying as Hungarian Jews, uh, for example, in Galanta, uh, for example, uh, in Topolcan, in Eperjes, and almost all of these places getting a Slovakian name. Uh, okay. Um, uh, can I interrupt for a moment? Um, yeah. You know, I don't know if you're aware, my mother was from Eperjes, which is Preshov, and oh they had. My. God. Yeah, and she attended the, she had Beis Yaakov teacher there, and she was very eager to continue her studies. She was very academic, and uh, apropos to the discussion about gymnasium, she asked her father if she could go to gymnasium, and he was very firm, and he first said yes, and then she was the youngest in the family, and then he had second thoughts and decided to send her to Beis Yaakov in Vienna, but after the Anschluss, the Beis Yaakov in Vienna moved to Pressburg. Um, and there was a teacher's seminary in Pressburg, which my mother attended. Really, thank you so, so much, Rivka, for the useful information. I would love to talk to you. Actually, this map is before the Anschluss, so we don't see these seminaries there. And thank you so, so much. It was so important for us uh, to learn. And also, you are, you, you are the first person from Eperjes that I, that I ever meet. <laughs> Okay, and, and, I, and I usually meet him from from uh, Jews from all over the places. It's it's really amazing. I would love to speak to you, so feel free to reach out to me. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, uh, Naomi Seidman has my contact information, so we're we'll all right here. Great, great. So what we could see that almost all Slovakian Jewry is basically used to be Hungarian Jewry, but uh, it's actually not completely united, uh, not as Hungarian Orthodox Jewry because we have the Oberland and we have the Unterland. So what do you mean Oberland? Oberland is more a Western type of Orthodoxy. This is definitely non-Hasidic Orthodoxy, but we couldn't say that they are like the Litvaks. They are not like the Litvaks. It's something, it's like an own breed. It's a own type. And Oberlandish Orthodoxy after the Shoah, we could say uh, it's really, really in downhill. Uh, very few people identify with that. It was also very much uh, part of a certain historical reality. But uh, in Western Hungary, or in Upper Hungary, most of the Jews uh, were more Oberlander Orthodox if they belonged to Orthodox communities. And many of these Slovakian communities were very, very Orthodox. Uh, very close to Austria, in a map, we could see a place which is called Golanta. Golanta uh, housed a big yeshiva, if I'm not mistaken, that was the Buxbaum rabbinic family. And, uh, and uh, uh, students from all over Hungary 
sometimes even from uh, even from the Carpathians get into the Galanta Yeshiva. It had a very, very good name. Definitely, definitely Oberlandic style orthodoxy, non Hasidish. Uh, also, mm -hmm. Also, um, one, one thing I would like to tell you, because my father went to the Galanta Yeshiva um, really? and he loved it. It was really the most, the preeminent Yeshiva in Hungary of its time. But even though it was a very overland community, the, the, the Rosh Yeshiva, the Rebbe, the Galanta Rebbe, who was also the rub of the town, took on very Hasidic practices. Really, thank you so, so yeah. much, uh, so, so much for telling me this. And I see it in the chat that my father was a Mara Marosher, Siget. We will talk about Siget as well, very, very soon. <laughs> so, uh, so it's fascinating. I'm, I'm very, very happy to hear about Galanta and Eperiash and all the Oberland because it's kind of, uh, kind of understudied today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we also have a place which is called Silain, uh, and this is a Zsolna in Hungarian. It was also a Beis Yaakov school there. Uh, again, one small problem with the map. Uh, when I looked for the places, I told myself, wait a second, all of these names are supposed to be Slovakian, Romanian, Hungarian, local names, according to the registration of the 1930s. Uh, I didn't find this name, Silain, in the Slovakian list, because here they forgot and they used the German name of the place. Uh, okay, so uh, that was the one mistake, or maybe one or two, but the, uh, what the drawer of the map made. Uh, if we are talking uh, about the area of Presho, Eperiash, and Kosice, we are going and moving more to the east. So here we will have more influence of Unterland Jewry already. And uh, Kosice or Kosha in Hungarian is a very, very big city in Eastern Slovakia. It's a huge Jewish hub. And uh, what we can tell about this city that all different types of Jewish streams are very strong in that place. Also the more modernist streams and also the more orthodox streams. Uh, for example, the famous Jungreis family that they originally from Northeast Hungary, uh, they also have a descendant and famous rabbi in Kosice or in Kasha. And uh, uh, many Galician and Ukrainian immigrants getting into Kosice. So they are bringing their own influences to the city as well. There are also very Western elements going to Kasha Kosice because it's also a commercial hub. So it's creating a very eclectic uh, type of Judaism. And even a Rebbe arrived to Kosice, who is the Rebbe of Stropkov. And uh, he even was buried there. Stropkov is an offshoot of Shinyava and Sands. So they are connecting to the Halberstam family. Uh, so this is what we can say about Kosice uh, very briefly. Uh, uh, if we are talking about uh, uh, those ones who are more on the right, this is real Unterland. We could see the names Ushgorod and Hus. So these are real Orthodox Hasidic places. Uh, for example, uh, in Ushgorod, we could say uh, that today is Ukraine, actually, the Western part of Ukraine, then it was part of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and uh, I had the chance to talk to old survivors like 20 years ago, and uh, uh, even survivors who came from this area, 
and they remembered many things from the 1930s. And they told me that under the Czechoslovakian rule, they, they, they found that they, it was like a dream. They really liked that regime. Definitely, they didn't like the Hungarian regime, which was afterwards uh, uh, in the interim period. And, and for sure, they didn't like the Soviet regime because these places actually got to be part of the Soviet Union, uh, who stand Ushgorod. Uh, Can I interrupt with one piece of information about Ushgorod, which at, during uh, between the world, world Wars, it was called Ungvar. Um, yeah. they, had a, they had a Hebrew gymnasium, which was religious, which was run by, I think, B'nai Akiva. And all subjects, which it was a gymnasium with a, gra you know, which one graduated, but all subjects were taught in Ivrit. My father was a graduate of that. Also in Munkach. Munkach. But Munkach, the Munkach gymnasium was not orthodox. It wasn't religious. It wasn't religious. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and uh, in Ungvar, we also have a very, very famous personality uh, whose name is Shlomo Gansfried, who was mm -hmm. actually the author sure. uh, of the Kitsu Shukhanaro. And uh, this is a place not like Koshita, not like Kosha, that, uh, that here uh, the modernist tendencies and the reform is not really acceptable. Zionist movement, yes. The various Zionist movements, yes, it is acceptable. So if we are moving down to Hungary, which is Hungary, which remained Hungary after the peace treaty, we could see something very strange. Only 1931. 1931, we could see the code, and in German, it says, Schulen in Gründung. It means that schools in establishment. They did not establish. It means that 1931, that there is no single base Jakob school in Hungary. And Hungary has a very, very, very big Jewish uh, community. And uh, probably uh, it's like very well known that Hungary has many times extremist tendencies. It could be very, very extremist uh, in, in the assimilation, in the reform, we could call it more neolog. And it also has their own almost militant orthodoxy. But why in a community that it has a population of almost every stream, and there are also middle of the way Orthodox communities, why there is no base Yaakov death in 1931. And why only in two big communities in Budapest and in Jur are thinking about to establish the school. What do you think? What is the reason? I really would like to ask you. Hungarian. Do you have an idea? I think the rabbis were against it. The rabbis were against it. Uh, yeah, the, there is influence in uh, Hungary, in this remaining Hungary, also of those rabbis who are against it. But these very influential rabbis who are extremely against the Beis Yaakov school and the Agudat Israel itself, they don't live in the main Hungarian part. Uh, for example, the Minhas Eleazar of Munkac, he is in Czechoslovakia, according to the geography, and Rabbi Oli Steitelbaum of Sotmar uh, is uh, having a community in Romania, according to the geography of the day. So they do have influence in Hungary, especially in the Eastern parts, but their influence in Budapest, especially in Western Hungary is not that big. So I answer to the question. The problem is 
with the Agudat Israel. Hungarian Orthodoxy, even though that they were not against the Aguda officially, and officially they joined the Aguda, the, the major Hungarian uh, Orthodox organization, but they completely prohibited to the small communities and uh, independent uh, organizations to join the Aguda. They even prohibited that Aguda activists should come to Hungary and try to do propaganda for the Aguda. What was their problem? And many of these Orthodox leaders are in the same platform religiously as most of the Agudists in were. So the whole question is, Hungarian Jewry was always a little bit stand apart and live apart, and they had this type of idea that we are not messing with the Hungarian authorities, Hungarian non-Jewish authorities. We not need an international organization amongst ourselves. It maybe could hijack our opportunities. We will manage ourselves, and uh, we just don't need that. And there were actually uh, independent organizations and grassroots, uh, uh, grassroots uh, uh, actually aims to bring the Aguda to Hungary and, and uh, make like more youth groups of the Aguda, so on and so forth. But it's basically never happened officially. It's only happened officially that the Aguda as an organization get active in Hungary, it's only happening after the Holocaust. In that tiny period that after, after the Holocaust and the communist takeover. And uh, beforehand, uh, there were certain officials that they want, and they want to bring Aguda activity to Hungary. And the major Orthodox office tells them, no, it's prohibited. Only in the 1930s, they becoming more light about it. And I think that this type of attitude, we could see also in the establishment of the Beis Yaakov schools, because the Beis Yaakov schools are so, so much associating with the Agudat Israel movement. And also these two places in Hungary, that there is a Beis Yaakov in establishment, within the years, one of them is in Budapest, the capital city, that there is an Orthodox Jewish variety of different streams. And the other one is Jur, is a quite affluent uh, city in, uh, in Western Hungary. And uh, it wasn't so famous about the Orthodox uh, Jewish scholars that there were some but it was a much more reformist community at large. But in the 1920s and in the 1930s, the Orthodox Jewish community is growing, the Snyder's rabbinical family is very, very much influential as much as in the 1930s, they establishing an Orthodox Jewish beach where women and men could bathe separately in separate hours. Uh, so uh, since the community is quite affluent, it has a relative closeness also to Austria and to Czechoslovakia, and it's making it an economical hub. It's also, uh, uh, it's also give us uh, the way to think that since uh, the community is affluent, they also had the, uh, the assets to, uh, to like uh, have this type of uh, girls school amongst them. Uh, Romania would be the most interesting, I think, how much time we have. Oh my gosh, I, uh, I think I have the time, but please give me another five minutes. Okay. We will, we will finish with Romania. I, uh, when I did this uh, prepared for the class, I found out that the most interesting part could be Romania here. 
because it's so colorful it's so uh, it's so not what we expect uh, so most of uh, these places uh, which we uh, see as Romania, they were uh, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, either as part of Hungary, Greater Hungary, or the part of Bukovina. So we see very close to the Hungarian border, a place called Oradja, which is Nagyvárad in Hungarian. Nagyvárad was one of the biggest, most affluent and most developed cities in Hungary before they actually uh, gave it to the Romanians. Uh, also, there are uh, a lot of modern Jews uh, in Oradja, it's a big city, but there is a considerable amount of Orthodox Jewish uh, population as well. And guess what? A place that it wasn't so Hasidish, becoming quite Hasidish as well after the First World War, because the Ahavat Israel, Rebbe Israel Hager of Vizhnit moving there. And he held his court in Oradja, Nagyvárad. So it's kind of bringing uh, a, new, uh, a new type uh, of orthodoxy to this, uh, to this big city. Uh, uh, and uh, we need to say that uh, Vizhnit is extremely influential in this Romanian area. And uh, the Hagers are relatively moderate and uh, they are very much big supporters of the Aguda. There are even family members who are even closer to uh, Zionism, uh, maybe not officially, but, uh, but uh, uh, definitely is not an uh, anti-Zionist Orthodox movement in the Munkach or the Satmar sense. Either they are very close to the uh, Aguda, maybe 80, 90% of them, and some, uh, some relatives, they could, uh, they could even have some affinity to the more uh, religious Zionist strings. Uh, if we are uh, moving up and see this name, Siget, uh, visual the source and borsha we arriving to a completely different universe and this universe is called mara maros mara maros is really a, a very pastoral place uh, in in the geographical way because it's by the carpathian mountains a stunning view uh, a lot of people were very poor, living in small mountain villages. It's really amazing for contemplation and spirituality, but uh, also they had a very, very hard life. And uh, in Sige, which is actually the capital of this Mara Marosh uh, county, a very, very rich Jewish life developed. In terms of Orthodox Jewish communities, uh, there is a tension between uh, the Hasidim of Vizhnit and the Hasidim of Siget, the Taitel Bomb dynasty. The Taitel Bomb dynasty were all, all, always more militant. Also, Satmar is coming from the Siget branch. And, uh, and uh, they, had, uh, they had various uh, misunderstandings between them. But my question is, if the Siget court is so big, uh, in Siget itself, why they are establishing a base Yaakov school. Very easy, because of the presence of Vishni and also the presence of Krechnya. And this is actually uh, making the place more open to this movement and also to Aguda activities. Uh, Borsha and Felsővisó in Hungarian, they are also typical Maramaros communities but the rabbinic leaders are not coming anymore from the title bombs, but they are coming from Vizhnit and they are Hagers. We could also uh, see names a little bit more on the right, like Sucheva and Radauti or Rados or Seret, Vizhnit. This is completely Vizhnit's 
area, apart from this, that Radha Uti, also another branch of Hasidism, the Boyan Sadigura branch of Ruzhin appearing, uh, they are also very, very supportive of the Beis Yaakov movement. And uh, in uh, Cherna Uti, which I said that that was the capital of Bukovina, and in the Yiddish Jewish name it's Chernovitz, is one of the most important uh, Jewish centers in Eastern Europe, and it has a very, very, uh, very notable history. And also rabbis like the Bermayim Haim of Chernovitz, uh, uh, it's something uh, it's something very characteristic. And uh, and the teacher training seminary uh, of Chernovitz, Cherna Uti, really gave the basic of teachers probably for all Romania. And Professor Zeidman's mother was teach uh, was uh, studying uh, in the. Chernovitz uh, uh, Beis Yaakov Teacher Training Seminary. One of the outskirts of uh, Chernovitz is called Sadigura. So we could meet here names that, uh, that probably we heard before. And one last thing, of course, the Vizhnitz and Seret is coming back to us. And there is a place, it's called Sucheva or Socheva or Shots in, uh, in the Yiddish version. Uh, they also have Hagers, but they also uh, have a Shotzer Rebbe from the Moshkovitz dynasty. Uh, but the most famous and most well-known Jewish Orthodox person who was born there is none else than uh, Rav Meir Shapiro. Rav Meir Shapiro who established the Dafyomi and also Yeshivat Chachamei Lublin. His life story is fascinating. We could say that from a Romanian Hasid, he becoming a Polish statesman uh, on behalf of the Agudat Israel. And also from a dyslexic child, he became a Rosh Yeshiva. In his short life, what he accomplished, it was something unbelievable. And of course, we could, we could imagine that uh, the Beis Yaakov, uh, uh, movement will find a school in shots in the birthplace of Rav Meir Shapiro. It's very, very logical. Uh, he is one of the one of the major uh, major representatives of the Aguda. He is from shots uh, from Bukovina, so obviously. Uh, uh, the community is that type that uh, it really need a school to be opened there. And uh, his life is also just representing that uh, um, beginning of the 20th century Orthodox Jew who was born in Bukovina in the part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and becoming a rabbi in Galicia in that time, also before the First World War, uh, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so he's not moving. And after Galicia becoming part of Poland, he, he's staying and he becoming a Polish rabbi, a Polish Aguda activist. And in history, he's listed completely as one of the giants of Polish Jewry, but Actually, he was born and spent his childhood in Shots or Sukeva in Romania, in Bukovina. So thank you so, so much. Thank you for your patience as well. And uh, I don't know, Shira, if we have time for questions. I will be very, very happy to answer that. Hello? Hello. Gabriella, can you say something more about Yavna and how it how it came to be? Is it a rival of Beis Yaakov? How extensive was it? I'm not. I'm definitely not an expert on Yavna. I'm definitely not an expert on Yavna. But what I heard actually, Rebbe Esther Farbstein 
she she makes uh, very very extensive uh, research on Yavna schools as well. Uh, what I uh, think and and what I heard that uh, that it was yes it was kind of a rival uh, of the base Yako. Uh, I think that it only existed in Lithuania. Uh, in the beginning, and uh, if someone could uh, could tell me more about the Yavna schools, I would be very very happy about it. What I learned that uh, they were even more scholarly uh, oriented and more uh, even more keen on secular studies. So that makes a lot of sense because the Yavna that survived and came to America yes. came along with the Telsi Yeshiva, and they Absolutely. and they are definitely a, elite, much you know higher elite. level. Scholarly, yeah. very and, scholarly. And Rebetzin Osman allowed the girls to go to college along with <laughs> seminary studies. Yeah, but also one of the first uh, teachers uh, of the Beis Yaakov, they came from German background. And for example, uh, Freilein Doctor uh, from, from England uh, in the future, she had a doctorate uh, from one of the German universities. And uh, her help really needed to establish the teacher training seminar. So in the beginning, it, it wasn't like this. But uh, Yavne was definitely more scholar oriented. And also Lithuanian Jewry in many ways were more modern than Polish Jewry. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I missed I missed who you said. Which who were the rabbis in Hungary that were so opposed to the Aguda? What did it come from the Teitelbaum family? The Teitelbaums are very opposing to the Aguda. And the arch enemy of the Akuda is the Minhat El Azar of oh, right. uh -huh. He even had a saying, Bar Kamsa. Who is the enemy? Bar Kamsa. What is the Bar Kamsa? It's an acronym. Bundistim, Revisionistim, Communistim, Mizrahistim, Zionistim, Agudistim. For Aguda was an arch enemy. He actually quarreled with everyone, even with the living trees. When the uh, when uh, the Belzer Rebbe uh, during the First World War, Rav Yitzhak Hardov uh, Rokach moves to Munkach, he quarreled with him as well. And the Belzers were much more hardliner than the Aguda. For him, the Aguda was like Zionism or uh, religious Zionism or even secular yes. Zionism. He constantly attacked Aguda by not attacking completely the Zionist movement. And he said, no, 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 no. They say that they are anti-Zionist or non-Zionist. Uh, uh, no way, it's a new form of Zionism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Balance, very, very extreme. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my father was born in Kotzman in Clifodin around Chernovitz. Really? He was born together with the two Vizhnitz Rebbes. Oh. After the war, they emigrated to Gross Vardan, Radia Mare, and then they met again with the same rabbi. That's unbelievable. And um, actually, Katzman is in this path, and I think that they, uh, that they put it they put it in the wrong direction, and this, uh, this, the other fault, like the other mistake that they made. The first mistake was the name of Silain Jona that they used the German name, and the second mistake was actually Katzma. That yes, is, that it's close to Chernovitz. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, it's very close to Chernovitz, and my mother is and from in the, in the map is not. So this is the second mistake what they did. Uh -huh. And my mother is from the, from Zastavna. Wow. Also around Chernovitz. 
uh, can I what type of communities did they belong to? If your oh, mother Zastavna was highly Zionist, Shabbat mm -hmm. on the street, they spoke only Hebrew. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. My grandmother was a widow. My mother became an orphan at 12 years old or 13. And my grandmother had a butcher shop, a kosher butcher shop. So she had a Bachur Yeshiva staying by them and teaching five girls Hebrew. So all of them were fluent. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, and your yeah. father, uh, what type of community he grew up in? Catholic? My father grew up in, uh, in Clevodin. Uh, there were farmers. But his father was a Chort for Chusid. Chort for okay. Okay, totally father, makes sense. Completely yeah. makes sense in this area. Even though Chortkov is a little bit further away, but uh, it's the same branch of Hatiduyot. So they came. They came from Chortkov. Chortkov. They lived ah, they in Chortkov. Chortkov. Before that, the great-grandfather lived in Chortkov, and he wanted to buy a farmland to become a farmer, because in Poland he could not. So he moved from Galicia, he moved to Bukovina. Wonderful, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing, amazing story. What is your name? Chaim Fruchter. Chaim Fruchter. Yeah. yeah, thank thank you so, so much for this fascinating story. I have one more question. I'm wondering, yeah. didn't no bait base Yaakov came to America after World War I? Because the Aguda was some was somewhat here, and uh, they were so afraid of the assimilation, um, they, they didn't start a base Yaakov here, either the after school kind or any other kind in New York. I what I heard that there are base Yaakov schools in America, definitely. They are not so much uh, associating with the Aguda as in Eastern Europe, and in the later 1930s. Rebetz and Vishnya Kaplan moving to America, and then she establishing a whole day based Yaakov school. That's in William's book. Yes, 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 yes. But this was also before the start of the of the Holocaust, as I remember. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So I was born. I was born in Siget. Oh. oh. And I and they did have a sort of Besyakov there, but more likely like a Tamatur style that we have here. Meaning we went to we had to go to public school in the morning, and mm -hmm. in the afternoon we had a few hours of, of learning. But Siget was an interesting city. You had a lot of modern groups there, and it was uh, Pulling from both sides. Even yeah. though I grew up in a Hasidic circle, but they were more modern groups. Uh, there was, a, as a matter of fact, before World War II broke out, they had a gymnasium. Even Munkak had a secular gymnasium, so the influence of these uh, very characteristic people doesn't mean that everyone is the same in ideology. And some mm. people are just more Zionist or more culturally Jewish. But, yeah, but the Siako wasn't such a high level. I understand, I understand. And uh, may I ask you that, uh, what was your family belong to? Were they Vizhnitz more or Kretschnitz? Oui, oui. Yeah, there is a, a, a breakout from business. It's called Antonir. Oh, really? Really? So Be my father was an Antonir Hossard. Really? To visit. I remember it as a, kid, as a baby, as a kid. That's, that's unbelievable. The Rebbe who, uh, who actually uh, martyred in the Holocaust because he did not uh, he did not agree that the community will go and and he just escaped. Antony Rebbe, he was not a regioner. 
No, no, no. Ocelia. No, it, it was the. Ocelia is Hager, it's a Vizhnitz offshoot. It's a Vizhnitz offshoot. And the city, they were separated, sort of. Uh, but the Vizhnitzers are also regionals from the original. Uh, no, Vizhnitz no. is originally from Kosovo, and they did marry into the family of Rebbe Israel of Ruzhin, and there were marriages between them, the free ah. Hagers quite often, as yeah. much well that there were also marriages between the Hagers and the Horovitzes from Jikov and other Ropschitz line. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Thank but you. But Vizhnitz uh, uh, is, is not like branching out from Ruzhin. There are marriages between the two communities, absolutely. And Otenia is from, from Vizhnitz. May I ask you your name that you said that you are from Sigat and you were Otenia Hasidim? Uh, my name at the time was Feldman, Hava Feldman, but today I'm mm. the street. Wow. Um, well, I, I, I was lucky to leave a few weeks before the Germans came into Hungary, so I really didn't go through the Holocaust. Oh, wow. I understand. And you are lucky. Literally, literally six weeks before. Wow. And you live, in, you live in New York, yeah? Yes. I'd love to talk to you. I would I would love to talk to you. It's so okay. You get so from fast. them the num the connection. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, sure. So sure. How your, your name was listed? Bistritsky. Chava Bistritsky. Bistritsky. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. Okay, thank okay. You. Have thank, a, you. thank you so, so much. Thank you for thank everything. You Have a great day. Bye. Bye.